Today on The Hookup, we're gonna dive back into Node-RED and Home Assistant to take a look at beginner, advanced, and expert versions of motion detection lighting and mobile notifications. And along the way, I'm gonna show you some new tips and tricks that you might not have seen before. If you're into home automation and home assistant, but you've never touched Node-RED, I'd highly recommend you watch my other videos first, but the basic concept is that Home Assistant is great for getting all your devices under one locally controlled ecosystem, and then Node-RED, specifically the Home Assistant Node-RED add-on, is the perfect environment to automate them. Let's start with the easier of the two automations to get our feet wet, which is motion-based lighting, because it seems great in theory, but you'd be surprised how annoying it is when done poorly and the lights turn off when you're still in the room. In one of my earlier Node-RED videos, I showed this sequence, which uses the Home Assistant event state node to monitor the state of a motion sensor, and then that goes into a switch node to separate the states between motion on and motion off. If there is motion, the lights turn on, and if there's no motion, it goes into a trigger node that delays the payload for 15 seconds to see if the motion sensor will be triggered again, in which case it would clear the 15 second timer and wait until the next time that there's no motion to start that timer. If you want to decrease the chances of your lights turning off while you're still in the room, you can just increase the wait time on that trigger node. And while this sequence still works today, the Home Assistant Node-RED integration has gotten a lot better since 2018. And the beginner's version of this automation can now take place almost entirely in the event state node itself. To do it, I'll select the motion sensor from the auto-populating dropdown. Then for output, I want to put is off and for 15 seconds. When I click done, my event state node will have two output connections. The top one will output only if the state has been off for 15 seconds, and the bottom one will output any state that isn't off. After that, all I have to do is connect a call services node to the top connection to turn the lights off, and a call services to the bottom connection that will turn the lights on. The on payload will happen immediately on motion, but the off payload will wait 15 seconds after a no motion payload before turning the lights off. And again, to decrease the chances of the lights turning off while I'm still in the room, I could just increase that 15 second delay. My motion sensor only has the states on and off, but Home Assistant does have two other states that correspond to data availability. The first is unknown, where there's no historical data and nothing has been recently reported, and the second is unavailable, where the motion sensor itself has lost connection with Home Assistant. If I click on the event state node, I can see a bunch of options at the bottom that pertain to the unknown and unavailable states. The other checkbox that I have in my event state node is exposed to Home Assistant, which is there because I have the Node-RED companion integration installed through Hacks. If I check that box, I get a switch in Home Assistant that allows me to enable or disable this specific sequence. And that could be super useful for motion sensor controls if the lighting is in a theater room where you wouldn't want a motion event to turn on the lights during a movie, or in an office where you could override the motion sensing lighting based on time of day or other data like a computer being on. If I wanted to step this automation up to a more advanced level, I could just dim the lights after 15 seconds of no motion and then wait an additional 15 seconds before actually turning them off. While well, this isn't a perfect solution, dimming is a lot less jarring than the lights turning off completely and gives you a visual cue that motion hasn't been detected in a while. To do this, I'll add a trigger note and in the output, I'll put the string dim and then wait 15 seconds and then send the string off. The actual messages that I'm sending here don't matter and I just do that to help me visualize what's happening in the sequence and to make it easier to debug later if needed. In the trigger node, check the box that says send second message to a separate output and reset if message.payload equals should be set to on. Then I'll connect the trigger node to both the outputs of the event state node, put in a call services to turn the lights off on the bottom output of the trigger, and in the top output, I'm gonna put a call services node for turning the lights on, but to a lower brightness. To do that, I'm gonna to need to specify some data in the call services node, which is much easier to do than ever before. You can see that once I select the light turn on service, I get a list of all the possible attributes that I can specify. Let's say I want to set the lights to 50% brightness. For that, I would use the brightness percent attribute. So I can copy it, then go to data, select JSON, click the three dots, and then go to visual editor. Then I click on add an item, paste in my brightness percent attribute, and put in 50 for the value. Technically, Home Assistant does want a number here, not a string, but it's smart enough to convert it so you don't need to worry about it. If you feel comfortable writing your own JSON, you obviously don't need to use the visual editor, but I think it's a pretty cool feature. The other thing that I need to add to this automation is brightness in the call services node for when motion is detected. So I can just copy that JSON data that we just generated, go into my other call services node, and paste it into the data field with my desired brightness, which I'm gonna go for 100%. But I hear what you're saying. Maybe you don't always want the brightness to be 100%, and maybe you want to be able to set it. And that brings us to our expert level automation. 
For this, the warning brightness is going to be 50% of whatever the existing brightness was. And then on motion, I'm going to dynamically set the brightness back to whatever it originally was. To do this, I'll add a current state node in between my trigger node and my low brightness node. In the current state node, I'll select my light entity. Then in message.payload, I'll output the state. In message.data, I'll output the entity, which will give me all of its attributes. And then I'll add one additional output as a flow variable called flow light brightness, which will also contain my entity data. To set the brightness to 50% of its current brightness, I'll need to know where that current brightness data is being stored. So I'll grab a debug node, set it to output the complete message object, and then I'll put it after the current state node. Now when that part of the sequence is triggered, I can see the output in my debug window. And if I click down into message.data, I can see that there's an attribute called brightness. And if I hover over it, I can click on the first icon and that will copy the path to that attribute. Now in my call services node, I can replace my hard-coded brightness with message dot and then paste in the path that I just copied and then add divided by two at the end. This is also specifying the brightness out of 255 and not the brightness percent out of 100. So I'm gonna change that attribute from brightness percent to just plain brightness. You'll also need to make sure that the message.data path isn't in quotes and you need to change the format of the data field from JSON to expression. I'm also gonna go back and edit the call services node for when motion is detected and change that hard-coded brightness to use this message.data.attributes.brightness, but this time not divided by two. However, since the brightness payload is generated after this point in the sequence, it isn't actually accessible to this node. And instead, I'll need to use that flow variable that I created earlier. To do that, I'll add a change node in between the events state and call services node to set message.data equal to flow.lightbrightness. I'm not exactly sure why the change node is necessary, and honestly, I was expecting to be able to call flow.lightbrightness in the data field of the call services node, but for some reason, it doesn't work, so the extra step is required. Let's do some quick tests to make sure everything is working as intended. Lights on to 75%. 15 seconds after the motion sensor reports no motion, I get 37%. Then 15 seconds after that, they turn off. And importantly, when the new motion happens, the lights come back on at 75%. Perfect. If you've got suggestions for something to make it in expert plus mode, go ahead and leave them down in the comments. Next, we're gonna move on to notifications, which have also changed quite a bit since I first covered them over four years ago. As you may know, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm in the process of testing basically every smart doorbell camera on the market. And in a perfect world, I'd love to have all the functionality of my doorbell without the use of any cloud service, but that's not exactly an easy task. The Unify G4 Pro doorbell, which just happens to be the doorbell that I have currently installed, does a pretty good job of integrating into Home Assistant locally through Unify Protect. But even though you can log into the Unify Protect app locally now, you won't get any notifications unless you use the Unify Cloud. And logging into Unify Protect via a VPN still doesn't work. So for our beginner's automation, I'm gonna to try to replicate the Unify Protect notifications in Home Assistant instead. To start out my sequence, I'm gonna use an events state node to grab my doorbell presses as they happen. So I wanted to set it to output only if the state is on, which is what happens when you press the doorbell. After that, I'll use the call services node to send a notification to my phone only by selecting notify as the service and then choosing my phone from the dropdown. If I use the notify.notify service, it would send a notification to every available device, but that's not what I'm looking for. You can see down at the bottom, I've got a few options for attributes to add to the data field. And I'm gonna select JSON from the format and then click on load example data. After that, I'll click on the three dots and go over to the visual editor. In here, I can change the title and the message, and for this service, I don't need to specify a target, so I can remove that entry entirely. There is an annoying bug in this version of Node-RED that doesn't let me add spaces to a string within the visual editor, but if I just ignore that, I can click on the normal JSON editor later and add the spaces there. Last, I want to convert the data entry to an object by selecting Object from the dropdown. Once I've done that, if I click on the arrow next to my data object, I can add an item. And the first item that I'm gonna add is the G4 Pro doorbell camera feed. To do that, I'll type in entity ID, and then I'll put in the name of the G4 doorbell camera. Unfortunately, in the editor, entity names don't auto-populate, so I'm gonna need to type in that camera name exactly. Once you're done with that, hit deploy and test it out. A quick test of the doorbell shows that the automation is working as intended, and the beginner sequence is done. To step it up to a more advanced level, I'm gonna add some action buttons to the notification. So go back into the call services node and then back into the visual editor and add another item to the data object. This item is gonna be called actions and it's gonna be an array of objects. So select array and then add an item to it. Each item will be an object with at least two parts. The first one is the event name that will be sent to Home Assistant when the button is pressed and that one needs to be in all caps. 
The second part is just the text that will appear on the actual notification button on your phone. To add a second button, all you need to do is click the arrow next to the first object and hit duplicate, then go through and change the entries as needed. I'm gonna have a total of two actionable buttons. First will be a canned message to just say, leave the package at the door, and I'll call that one leave package. And then just for fun, I'm gonna make a second one called please leave, which will tell the visitor that I'm not interested and turn on the front sprinkler system to encourage them on their way. If I save this node and hit deploy, my notification will work and I'll have two buttons, but neither of them will actually do anything. For that, I'll need to add a Home Assistant Events All node and tell it to look for the event type Mobile App Notification Action. After that, I'm gonna need a switch node to figure out which button got pressed and which action got fired. But before I can do that, I need to know where to look for the action name. So I'll add a debug node, double click it, and then select Output Complete Message Object. Now you can see that when an action is fired, the action name is in the message.payload.event.action. So again, I can click on Copy Path, and then in my switch node, I can just paste in that as my property that I'm looking for. After that, I'll add a different switch condition for each of my possible actions, and I'm ready to automate from there. If I wanna add more and different notification actions later, I can still just use the same events node and just continue adding event names into the switch node. For that CAN message, I'm gonna use the call services node with a TTS service and the G4 doorbell speaker as the media player target. I'll use the load example data button again to format my JSON and then edit my specific messages, which will be please leave a package at the door. I'll also have a TTS message for my please leave button, which will say, no thank you, we're not interested. And then after that, I'll give a 10 second delay before activating my sprinkler system zone in the front yard. Then I'll put in another delay node for one minute and I'll use another call services node to turn the sprinklers back off. Let's go test it out. No, thank you. We're not interested. All right, pretty good, but let's step it up to expert level. For the leave the package at the door action, I'm gonna add two more options to the notification itself. The first one is a URI, which will open up the Home Assistant app for my front yard cameras tab whenever the action is pressed. And the second will have behavior as the action and text input as the value, which will open up a keyboard on my phone to let me type in the TTS message. Just like before, I need to find out where that message ends up, so I can use a debug node with my Home Assistant events all node to find it. And sure enough, in message.payload.event.reply text, I can see the text input. So I can click copy path and then go to the TTS node, and instead of my original message, I'll paste the path of the text input message instead. For that go away action, I'll also add the URI for my front yard cameras tab in Home Assistant, but I'm also gonna make the sprinkler response a little bit smarter. This time, I'll use the current state node to see if the person detection on the G4 doorbell is still active, meaning the unwanted guest hasn't left, in which case, I wanna turn the sprinklers on. After that, I'm gonna use a new node called wait4 and set it to wait until the state is equal to none, meaning the person is no longer detected. I also don't want the sprinklers to run for too long, so I'll set the maximum timeout to one minute, and then I'll pump both of the outputs into a call services node to turn the sprinklers back off. And now we test. Perfect, let me know what else you would add down in the comments. Sorry it took so long, but I'm hoping that this video gave you at least a few ideas for how you can automate your devices with Home Assistant and Node-RED. And with any luck, it won't be another 14 months before I make another one. Thank you so much to all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.